Yeah, good morning everyone. It's uh, amazing to be here with you and it's, uh, uh, I'm just blessed to be able to stand here today and uh, just uh, say a quick prayer with you guys. Um, so everyone bow their heads. Dear Lord, I just thank you for today. I thank you that we're able to come and hear your message online. I uh, thank you so much that we've got people like Russell to come and uh, share your word and share it with um, passion and joy, Lord, and we just pray that you'll give us ears to ear, hear what you're saying through him today, Lord, that uh, you will guide his words as he's preaching, Lord, and that it'll be Holy Spirit filled. Uh, we're, we're, we're in awe of you, Lord, and awe of your word, and we're just so excited to hear anything you have to say to us, Lord, and yeah, we just ask that you lead this message and um, we put it in your hands, in Jesus' name, amen. So I'll, I'll just start off by uh, reading the scripture for this week. It's uh, from 1 Thessalonians 2, uh, from 1 to 8. It's about Paul's ministry in Thessalonica. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. You know we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else. Even though as apostles of Christ we could have uh, asserted our authority, instead we, like, we were like young children among you, just as nursing mothers care for her children. So we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. So this is an amazing bit of scripture and um, I'm excited to hear Russell, what Russell has to say. So we'll get him back up to uh, share his message for this week. Thank you, Russell. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for uh, opening the service for us. Last week we looked at Thessalonians, we looked at chapter 1, where Paul uh, encourages all the believers in Thessalonica and, uh, and tells them to continue. To, to, he was so excited that he, about how they had continued in the faith and their resilience. Chapter 2 takes a very different step. In chapter 2 we find that Paul is defending himself about his ministry. And as I read through the scriptures, I find there are a number of places where Paul diverts the attention to himself and uh, is sometimes talking about his academic record. You know, I was a student of Gamaliel. He talks about his industriousness. I worked harder than anyone else. And as you read this, I wonder if, sometimes I think, is Paul coming across as a bit arrogant when he talks about how much he suffered, how much he worked, how, how, um, how well he was uh, regarded in the amongst the rabbis. Paul's an interesting character. He is a bit of a paradox in many ways. He talks about himself as being the chief of sinners and yet uh, the next minute he'll be spelling out his own credentials. He proclaims grace and yet showed very little when Mark didn't go the distance and he and Barnabas had a bit of a fallout and went their own ways. He states no difference between, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave and free. And then in another breath he says women shouldn't be talking in church. But really that just portrays a very complex character. And it is also a reminder to us that sometimes we like to, we're all complex in many ways. And there always is a danger in reducing a person to one formula or one thing. We do that with Thomas. He's a doubter. We don't have much evidence that he's a doubter, but this poor fellow has carried that name for 2,000 years. And I grew up in a time when 
if you discredited someone, you'd say they were a communist or, or they were a, a socialist, and that spelled everything in one word. Now we talk about people as being a feminist or a, or a, um, a racist or, or a misogynist. But people are more complex than that. And the beauty of the scriptures is that it doesn't portray people in one dimension. It gives us the person warts and all. And in, uh, in life, we need to be careful that we don't take one section of scripture and try to make it sound as if that's the character of who this person was. So the question I ask is, why does Paul need to defend himself? And there's a simple answer for that because he's receiving a lot of opposition. He's come from uh, Philippi, as we said last week, under a cloud. He, he'd, he'd uncovered a lot of opposition in Philippi. He had been put in prison and now he comes to Thessalonica. And uh, he's only there a short time and then he's gone. And they're left with no support and no opposition. And so people move in who are opposed to Paul and start trying to discredit him. If you want to discredit the Christian message, quite often you attack the Christian messenger. Have you noticed that? How many times will people say, you don't believe that? You don't really believe that? Uh, you're supposed to be a Christian? And so they try to discredit the messenger. That happened to Jesus. People tried to discredit Jesus. And I wonder if there were times when Jesus' followers were wondering about his very radical thinking and the opposition he got. And they're trying to get their head around it, whether Jesus is a genuine article or not. And I'm sure these people in Thessalonica were in the same boat. Is Paul the real deal? Or is this just another fly-by-nighter who's come through with some new idea that will dissipate soon? So Paul writes. He writes not to... Uh, he writes to encourage them, but he writes not to spell out his, his uh, credentials, but he writes to defend his motives. This is the reason we came. And when people don't or are suspicious of your motives, it takes a long time to get round that. When we first asked the church if they wanted to, um, if they could use us, uh, they initially wanted me to go to Papua New Guinea to be principal of a school there. And so they sent me down to do some missionary training in Sydney. And during the course of that training, they talked about this mission field that I was to go to, to open up, to run this school. And they said, during the war, during World War II, when the Japanese were coming down, this mission, which was then in, uh, under the direction of the Methodist Church, the Methodist Church in Australia called all the missionaries back well, really, they called all the white Australian missionaries back. But there were two groups of missionaries on this field. One was a group of South Sea Islanders, and the other were the Australians. And when the Australians were called back, the mission was in charge or left under the control of the South Sea Islanders. So the very first Sunday, the leader of this group of South Sea Islanders preached on the message about the Good Shepherd. The good shepherd will, come, will, will defend his sheep when the wolf comes, but the bad shepherd runs away. The hired servant runs away. And it was a very pointed message. And when the war was over, it took an awful long time for the white missionaries to gain credibility in there. And so Paul's defence is important, that he makes sure they understand his motives before it gets out of hand. And it's important for us today, too, that people understand our motives because if we're doing our job as Christians we will face opposition we will face people who want to discredit us and there are times when we have to defend ourselves on certain things so how does Paul defend himself I believe as I read through this scripture that he defends himself on four criteria first one is courage he said you know, you, re you know how badly we had been treated at Philippi just before we came to you and how much we suffered there. Yet God gave us the courage to declare his good news to you boldly. His good news to you boldly. How many times have we been in a situation where we can proclaim the good news of God, of Christ, 
and yet we, we shudder and we say, oh, we don't really want to offend anyone. Because he says, no, we had the courage to come. And the Christian faith has survived for 2,000 years in spite of the opposition it has received because people have had the courage to come and even to suffer and to die for their faith. And to me, that depicts the genuineness of the gospel. When communism came to Russia, in the early days of communism, uh, it was, there was a strong, um, a strong contingent of the Orthodox Church in Russia. And so they had a meeting with some of the Orthodox priests and they harangued them for seven hours, talking incessantly about the benefits of communism and how the church had betrayed people and how following Jesus was not really important. And after seven, year, seven hours of constant haranguing, at the end of it, one priest stood up and he said three words. Jesus is alive. And the whole group went into uproar. Now what happened to that man, I do not know. But he was not going to let Jesus be discredited because he could not stop himself from proclaiming that Jesus Christ is his Lord. And Paul says, you know our courage. You know the courage we had. The second thing he had was integrity. Paul had integrity. He said, there was no trickery. We didn't come with flattery. We didn't come to, um, to uh, sponge off you. We, we were not a burden to you. We provided for ourselves. And he points this out. I know of a couple who went to a, an Aboriginal mission once and they found themselves not very well accepted when they tried to proclaim the gospel. And they couldn't work out why until they found out that six months before there had been an evangelist who had come through and people had been taken up with him and donated a lot of money towards him and one day he disappeared <laughs> with all the money. And so there was a suspicion there. And Paul says, we didn't come without integrity. You know, one of the greatest qualities that a Christian can have is integrity. And you know, there are two things, especially with integrity. If you have, uh, you can judge a person's integrity by the way they handle power. And you can judge a person's integrity by the way they behave when they think no one is watching. The third thing was conviction. Paul had a conviction that he was to go to the Gentiles. And that was a deep-rooted conviction because when Paul was on the Damascus Road and Jesus appeared to him and he was blinded for a few days, a man by the name of Gamaliel was called by God to come and talk to Paul. And so this, this believer came to this strong anti-Christ follower person and he said to him, God has called you to the Gentiles. He, proclaimed, he, he portrayed, um, conveyed to him the message that he had been given by God. And so Paul, from the very beginning, realised that he was approved by God. He was entrusted by God. And he says, my aim was to please God, not to please people, but to please God. You know, there's, there's a world of difference between working for someone and being part of a team. You know, when you, when you work for someone, you work so many hours and you do this, but if the boss brings you in and says, look, I want you to be a partner in this team, you work with a different outlook. There is a, uh, a greengrocer in one of the southern cities and what he does is every year he has his team of people who work for him as partners with him. And when they make a profit, they all share in that. They're not just partners, they are shareholders. And Paul says, I am convinced that I'm not just a person working for Jesus, I'm a shareholder in, in developing the kingdom of God. And finally, Paul says, we had compassion. He had sincere love for those people. Sincere love. That was the fourth one, compassion. As Synod is on at the moment, uh, I'm reminded of my times at Synod. Some of them were quite long and laborious. But one of the highlights of Synod every year was there would be a celebration of ministers who retired. 
And I remember one year at Synod, these ministers uh, were allowed to speak for two minutes. That's a bit of a miracle for a, for a pastor to speak for only two minutes. But they were given two minutes. And, and they had to just say something that they could give to the people who were still going on in ministry. Lay people, clergy, the whole lot. And one person got up and he said, love your people. Love your people. And he said, if you love your people, I think you're an even better, a better pastor than you really are. <laughs> and it's true. It's the loving of people. Stephen Covey wrote a book called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Some of you have read it and it was a bestseller. And, uh, and one of the things he says in that, and it sticks with me, is that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's right? Yeah, I got it right. So those four things really are his defence. He said we had courage, we had integrity, we had conviction and we had compassion. And that's what we need today to work together as a team for Christ. Courage, integrity, conviction and compassion. There was a small town once where an orchestra came to town. A big uh, multi-piece orchestra. And uh, the whole town turned out to listen to this orchestra. The, and the town hall was full. And the performance was wonderful. And as at the end of the performance, as they were walking out, the local pastor was walking out and one of his congregation came up beside him. And he said... Uh, Gee, pastor, how come you can't get a group like this in church on a Sunday morning? The church, the place is full. How come you can't do that? And he said, I could if I had an orchestra that was playing completely in tune. We are soldiers of Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are Christ's people. We are called to proclaim the gospel with courage. We are called to be in, you know, have integrity in all of our actions and, and because people are watching. We're called, above all, to be compassionate. We are called. Let's pray. Loving God, I thank you that Paul writes so convincingly. He writes encouragement to the followers, but he writes also saying, you know that our message is genuine because we were genuine when we came to you. And Lord, we think of today where Christians are often portrayed as, as two-faced, as um, hypocritical, as judgmental. And Lord, maybe some of that is true. And so we ask that you would help us to look deep into our hearts and say, have we acted with integrity? Have we shown courage when you've called us to do your will? Have we been fully compassionate or is it just the people you call us to? Lord, as a church, we repent that at times we have been lukewarm. As a church, we repent that at times we've been more concerned about policies than we have about people. We confess as a church that sometimes we have ignored the people who need us the most. So Lord, we, we, like Paul, ask that you would give us a heart that is true to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a moment for the offering and uh, we encourage you to give to the offering as, uh, as you see fit. As you know, there are things that have to be done and quite a, many, a number of things that we have to do in the church cost, are not cost free. Even though what Jesus gave us is free. Sometimes he calls on us to give a generous, generous heart. So let's pray over the offering itself. Lord, we, we thank you for your gifts to us. We pray that you would bless what we are prepared to give. May we give it with a courageous heart. May we give it with a compassionate heart. May we give it with a, a morally upright heart. And may we give it in a way that you call us to give, to be generous givers. Lord, you have given us so much. You've entrusted to us the money that we earn and the money that we're given. 
May we use it whether what in whatever way we give it away or in the way we keep it. May we use it to your glory in wisdom and in accordance to your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.